Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back. We are here to take a look into the future of the blockchain space with some of the brightest minds and biggest powerhouses in the industry in a panel presentation. So joining us today is our moderator, Rob Adams. He's the executive vice president of Input Output. Along with him is Roman Pellerin, the chief technology officer of Input Output. He's also with Friedrich Gregard, who is the CEO of the Cardano Foundation. Next to him, well, a couple, yeah, why not? Woo! Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> Sorry, Rob and Roman, I didn't know they were going to do that. <laughs> uh, we also have Jerry Fregascatos, Chief Commercial Officer of Input Output. We've got Joel Telpner, the Chief Legal Officer of Input Output, right there. Caitlin Long, the founder and CEO of Woo! Avanti Financial Group. Also local legend. And of course, last but not least, Charles Hoskinson. Yeah. <laughs> Rob? Boo. So the purpose of this panel today is to really talk about how we take the blockchain industry from something that is viewed by many as nascent into the mainstream. And despite all of the progress that we've made to this point in creating a more equitable world, it feels to many like blockchain is still a niche or a nascent um, technology that is, in some cases, a solution looking for a problem. Now, that's not me saying that, but you'll read that in the press. So today we're here to discuss how we actually turn blockchain into a mainstream technology for everyone. So to that point, it's going to take a lot of adoption of blockchain technologies um, for us to be able to call blockchain a mainstream technology. And it could be consumers, it could be individuals, it could be enterprises, it could be governments. Who do you think will be the next major adopter? And what kind of use cases do you think we'll have to provide for them in order for them to actually accept blockchain as a real solution for them? You can go with, with yeah. that one. Um, to complement what you were saying, I think uh, blockchain is a technology of its own time. So we have a use case. Because the technology exists, there was a need, right? In a world that globalizes uh, itself, uh, you need a technology that can go uh, across frontiers, cross borders, and uh, legacy systems are very slow uh, to, to create those bridges between nations, communities, etc. So I, I actually think that blockchain technology is not here uh, you know, randomly. I think it's a technology of it well, one time. I'd like to kind of just add to that very quickly because you spoke about constituents, individuals, businesses, enterprise, and governments. I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know where it's going to go, but I know what my preference is, that it continues to be grassroots, that it's powered by the individuals first, that small businesses are built on top of them, and then enterprise and governments come last, in my personal point of view. I think very much in the same vein of the... That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, very much in the same vein as the American economy, if you really think about it, when it's healthy, it's a consumer-based economy, and the majority of the, the economy is run by small businesses first, and then enterprise and governments last, and I, I, I'd like to keep it that way. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, working to get a bank going, a <laughs> traditional bank, uh, it is stunning how backward the traditional banking technology is, which is what takes so much time to integrate with it, and you can spin up a node on any of the top blockchain networks within hours, maybe days, and sync them, and um, it's months, if not more than a year, to integrate in with the traditional banking system. And to Jerry's point, enterprises really do truly make things complicated, and they don't operate by the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. And I think so, ma so many of the blockchain developers truly do keep it simple because the benefit is that we're operating on common open, open backend platforms. And the whole idea of that is so that anyone can join the networks. It's a, it's a concept of openness. And if it's complicated and the standards are too difficult to comply with, then you really truly need to have enterprise scale in order to join the networks. And of course, that's when networks like to build or when, when enterprises like to build walled gardens and permission applications 
to join their networks, and that's not what our industry is about. And it's much more powerful. Anyone else? So I probably have a slightly different view. Um, I look at it right now in the terms of maturity of the technology, but also the maturity of the regulation around the world. And what I'm looking at right now is that everything which is born digital and the operating processes are digital by birth, it works really well on blockchain. So essentially there's going to be two kinds of companies in the world going forward. Blockchain enabled companies and non blockchain enabled companies. And the blockchain enables will win every single time. Until we get to that part, it will be the gaming industry. There's two billion gamers out there who doesn't ask a question when they buy something digital native, right? It's going to be parts of banking, it's going to be in the middle of the enterprise processes. We cannot touch the physical world because it's not born, you know, digitally, but all in the middle. So the SAP, the Oracle Financial Systems, all of that, you know. We can take that out already with what Cardano have in these data. So, yeah, that's how I look at it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, I put all this time into my AMAs and my whiteboard videos and blackboard videos and so forth. And on average, they get about 25,000, 50,000 views. And yeah, I sum up all the views that I've had in my YouTube channel. I think it's about a million or two. And I say, wow, that's amazing. Like a million views, so incredible. And then you look at this video of a cat in a t-shirt playing a keyboard. <laughs> and uh, the damn thing has a billion views. <laughs> so uh, that's the problem with B2C consumer products. Is it's hard to predict sometimes what is going to light the fuse, ignite, and then suddenly you wake up and you have 2 billion people using it. And there's plenty of things where you've planned top down and you've done everything right, but you still don't really take off. And there's plenty of things where you've done everything wrong, and somehow you still win. JavaScript is actually the example of that. <laughs> it took 20 years to fix it. It's still being under construction. But yeah, you know, it's the lingua franca of the internet for programming. So when you think about blockchain adoption and cryptocurrency adoption, really it's more of a question of, well, what consumer experiences are now enabled with this that were not possible before? What made the iPhone magical were things like Google Maps. I remember GPS before you know, smartphones. You guys remember navigating on a phone before smartphones? You know what I did? I, I went to MapQuest. I printed it out. Yeah, how many of you guys use MapQuest and printed it out? Yeah. Yeah, yay for MapQuest, right? <laughs> and then you have this phone. It's like shows you everything, and it's step by step, and it's there, and it's dynamic. You don't have to print it, and it reroutes and stuff. Like that was an amazing experience, and it really wasn't possible at that scale, that cost, that level of consumerization before an interface like that existed. So what the industry is right now trying to figure out is what capabilities is the industry bringing to bear to B two B, B two C, and B to B to B G or whatever other acronyms exist uh, that are now new and you've never seen before. So, for example, when you think about e-voting, yeah, it's a little side thing. Well, you know, let's say you just want to know what day to have the parade. Let's say the Broncos win the Super Bowl. Well, you're going to have a parade on Tuesday or Thursday. What happens when you have the superpower to click a button and poll every single person who's a registered Denver voter? and get an answer from them and see statistically what's what with a secure voting system and it's just like a push thing to their phone. That's the kind of stuff that our industry is going to enable and we're not quite sure which one of these is going to be the cat video that takes off and gets a billion views and which ones will kind of be like Charles's AMAs and not be so popular. Uh, but you know, we'll have something in between and uh, I think within five, ten years we're going to figure it out. And really the key is just to be flexible and adaptive enough that whatever that future happens to look like, uh, you'll, you'll be able to be competitive in it. Interesting. So it's interesting, Jerry, that you said that you thought it was going to be all bottom up when the two large announced deals we have are ones with government and ones with enterprise. Um, how do you reconcile that? I don't think it requires reconciliation. I think it's part of the okay. grand ecosystem. Ultimately, all right. I'm saying is that the center of gravity should be with individuals. And back to Charles's point of B2B for C, yeah. the enterprises, and the target enterprise and government that serve consumers ultimately. So I don't think it's contradictory at all. I'm just saying that the power should lie with the individuals and, you know, enterprise has their role in that. It just has to be in the right context and, and it should be from the bottom up, I think is 
the ethos of our industry ultimately is what makes for a healthy society. We see societies that are bottom up are far healthier, more democratic than societies that are top down. So right. we should just continue to foster that. And in countries where it's supposed to be democratic, we're seeing the other um, side coming in. And we, our industry has a part to play to keep democracies healthy. Great. I, I think the enterprise and the, the bottom and the top, I don't really understand that. Uh, an enterprise serves services to customers. Customers are people, right? So it's always about people. The problem that we have is a friction when you want to switch from one enterprise to another. Try to move your content from Facebook to Instagram or to, you know, WhatsApp. It's a, it's a pain. And, and usually or often it's, it's not even possible. You have to do that manually, right? So with all those offers, digital offers across uh, our industry for the past 10 years, uh, you have a lot of silos. And people are lost in those styles. And logically, I am a user of X. I should be able to interact with a user of Y, right? And uh, blockchain are networks. Blockchain is just, you know, a technicality. Uh, those are networks of people. So how you uh, frictionless experience across uh, business works for, for the people. And that's the uh, theme I take. Great. So, Caitlin, you said something that I thought was really interesting. Um, you, you said how difficult it was to set up a bank, a lot of regulatory hurdles, and I think that's true for a lot of enterprises and governments for sure. But Wyoming's been a great example of friendly legislation toward blockchain. Do you think there's anything that, that um, Wyoming can demonstrate to other jurisdictions about how to treat this technology in a more friendly way to, so that we can add value for consumers? Oh gosh, lots, <laughs> lots and lots of ways. Um, and it, it's so funny because the smaller governmental units like other states or small countries have been very excited about what Wyoming has done. And the larger states and Washington DC government have tried to ignore us. Um, they're quietly behind the scenes calling Wyoming and asking, hey, can we get a copy of your bank regulatory exam manual? Or can we get a copy of your rules for this, that, or the other thing? Um, but they're very intimidated by it. And, and, and it, it's the classic Gandhi uh, phrase, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then you win. I'm not, comp I'm not quoting that correctly, but, but that's the idea. And um, it's, it's so funny. I just saw the Wall Street Journal article yesterday talking about everything that's happening in stable coins. And of course, you know, the Wyoming banks, which are already authorized and chartered, uh, we're just waiting for approval from the Federal Reserve. We're all caught up in everything that's going on in Washington, DC. But do you think the folks in Washington, DC want to pay any heed to what's going on in Wyoming? No, we don't get mentioned in the stories. So by the way, I'd appreciate it if you'd all like blow this up on social media because they, they love to ignore us. <laughs> and they won't be able to forever. Uh, but part of it is they won't be able to because they will hear it from their own constituencies. Uh, and so th th there are a lot of uh, alignments. We've had patience. We could certainly have had um, a more aggressive stance than, than we're taking, but it's paying off to, to be patient and just to work with other governmental entities because there's a long education process. And so, so far, I think that's, uh, that's been the right approach. But uh, Wyoming won't be patient forever. <laughs> this is still the place that's leading the charge with the most enabling regula regulatory environment. And it's precisely because we actually have people in positions of power in the state that have spent the time to understand it, including the regulator, the banking regulator. Yeah. You know, the important thing... <laughs> the important thing about what Wyoming is doing is they're not saying no regulation. They're saying the right kind of regulation. Mm -hmm. They recognize that when you have new and very disruptive technology, that disruptive technology, among other things, often moves at a pace well ahead of where our regulatory landscape is. And so regulators are playing catch up, and sometimes it's easier for them to simply say no than to really understand how we take existing regulatory regimes and change them, modify them, and do what we need to do to facilitate the new technology. And so what Wyoming is doing, which I think is great, is demonstrating that there are different ways 
to think about blockchain technology. Not to simply say, you know, it's a free for all, do whatever the hell you want, but to say that there are different ways to think about how we take what's important, ideas of protecting consumers, ideas of preventing fraud, how we take those concepts that we can all agree to and apply them in a regulatory way that makes sense for this new technology. And so when, when Washington or other states don't pay attention to Wyoming and what Wyoming is doing, they do that at their own risk. Do you see any other countries that are more friendly? Well, or? So that's a great question because I, I, the United States gets bashed a lot in this space right. about you know having a, just an awful regulatory environment and there are some legitimate criticisms that are, are that are warranted but right. at, at the same time we've got a history of having a very strong robust capital market regime strong legal regime protecting consumers and so that's that's like trying to move an aircraft carrier mm. Other countries that maybe didn't have the same legacy regulatory system have a benefit in that they can look at this new technology and experiment and innovate in ways that we can. So it doesn't mean that the United States is, is necessarily against crypto, against blockchain, but we, we, we do have a structure here that's harder to move quickly. And so we, just as we can learn a lot from Wyoming, we can also look at what uh, people, especially in smaller developing countries, are doing where they look at this technology as solving fundamental problems for their people, for their populations that desperately need to be solved. And so for them, looking at blockchain and trying to create an innovative legal regime around that uh, is, is something we're seeing a lot of wonderful experimentation on. And hopefully some of those things that we're, we're seeing outside of the United States will then come back and we can apply those here in this country as well. Right. So that brings up an interesting question. Um, we see a lot of, you know, we, we talked about governments being kind of at the bottom of the stack for adoption, right? But we do see a lot of experimentation in a lot of countries where they're trying to find ways to use decentralization as a, as a value proposition for their citizenry and for themselves, right? Is there, a, is there any way that we could think about the value proposition for decentralization for them? Is there a way we could articulate it so that I mean, for just from what we've seen out in the field. Well, we, I, I think an example, or financial inclusion. Mm. Now, we, we, we know that in, in a lot of emerging markets, one of the most wonderful things blockchain can do is bring financial services to people that haven't had them. So if you live in a part of the world where you don't have easy access to banking, or whatever banking services are there are too expensive to utilize, mm -hmm. we can bring blockchain solutions to try to democratize and bring that type of financial inclusion. We assume, however, that that's something that's only relevant in, in emerging markets. It is equally relevant in this country. There are still right. too many people, even in the United States, that are underserved by traditional financial institutions and structures where we need to be able to empower them financially and bring them into the economic landscape in a way they mm -hmm. never have before. And so we can take those same things that we're seeing in emerging markets and apply them, I think, just as equally uh, to the United States. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I, I could add to that. I mean, I think things were more decentralized in the past. Centralization has been a product of history. Or, you know, started with villages and then city-states and then large nations and so forth. And... I think the biggest drive towards centralization has been the Industrial Revolution. And we've lost a lot of things that we had in the past. Like if you look at old churches in Europe, they were beautiful structures. Modernization has killed that because back then you had generational artisans that would work on it. Right. And I think blockchain is finally a force in the modern age to kind of push us back to some of that value that we've lost historically. And I think that's an enormous selling point is that you've lost some of these things this is why things in the past look better in certain respects, and we can bring that back, and I think that's a, an incredible thing that we could do. Yeah, I think I said it before, right? I mean, so for those of you who don't know, I, I live in Switzerland. It's a, it's a great country. Uh, it has a bit of a federal system, a bit like the United States, and for many it's seen as a, as a leader also in, in regulation around blockchain. And I don't know sufficient around Wyoming and, and the U.S. to have a view on that, but what I, what I do know is that it is our job to help the regulators to understand what is the risk and what is the value add we're getting out of these new technologies. 
And if they don't understand, they will always take the protective choice, whether that is to keep their share and keep the money, or whether that is to go with where they see the votes are going. And let's be honest, I mean, the people who really understand blockchain, I mean, we are 0.001% of the world, right? And, and we are going out there with a fewer belief that we can change the world to the better. So we need to step a little bit away from the crypto of blockchain and step into what is the utility on blockchain and what is actually needed for these speculators. And what is needed for these regulators to take an educated choice, which might not make them popular today, but ensures that their country and the amount of countries who work together, that they can take the right choices for our planet Earth and our race going forward. I agree, I agree with that um, because the question is, is decentralization a, a, a political stand? I don't think it is. I, I think it's, uh, it's because legacy systems are creating friction in our daily life, in a, in a modern world, that blockchain emerges uh, as, a, as a choice. And then after it's not uh, covering everything, you, you just have the trust layer on top of the internet, but everything has to be built on top. The legal frameworks have to, to evolve. I was on a panel uh, last week with, uh, about patents. Patents need to evolve also. Because you can't lock the technology anymore, but you need the royalties to pay people who are working uh, hard on, on some con context. So uh, it's, no, it's a new concept to invent. How you reward people contribution, right? The, the merit of people. You, you know, the, the, there are some institutions that are broken and probably need to be thrown out. But we shouldn't assume that decentralization is, is intended to get rid of all existing institutions. Decentralization used the right way can actually strengthen institutions and bring trust back to institutions and work in a, in a way that facilitates what institutions were meant to do in the first place. And so if we don't trust, for example, I heard you talk about this earlier today, if we don't trust the existing voting system, we, we lose faith in our institutions. Right. So rather than throw the institutions out, we use blockchain technology to create a better way to verify voting and create that faith in government again because we know that the vote that took place was a legitimate vote and not a so-called fake vote. So we can combine decentralization together with our institutional framework, and that, to me, is a win-win for everybody. So you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. The, what gives an institution legitimacy, and why do we care about institutions? We care about institutions because institutions help you navigate complexity. You know, you guys eat food, you drink water, you do things. And you have a lot of faith and trust in that food, that water. People of Flint, Michigan, the institutions failed them. They had lead in their water. Uh, how do you know the food you're eating isn't spoiled? Uh, how do you know that food doesn't have botulism in it? Well, because there's the FDA. There's all these institutions <laughs> that exist. Maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. So. Usually, civil society starts breaking down when people lose faith in institutions. They usually lose faith in institutions when institutions demonstrate opaqueness, information asymmetries, hypocrisy, where they seem to have double standards, corruption, these types of things. The point of blockchain technology is that it allows us to reconstruct institutions on top of things that watch the watchers on top of things that allow us to verify the things we're being told are true. It's less of a question of decentralization and centralization. It's more of a question of what gives you your root of trust. Centralization exists for optimization. That's the point of it. And in many cases, it's desirable. Decentralization exists for resilience. Ecosystems, if one species goes extinct, not everything else goes extinct, it somehow recovers. If a wildfire breaks out, if you have a diverse ecosystem, the jungle recovers, the forest recovers. I live in a ranch. I have a lot of trees on the ranch. Almost all the trees are having a hard time right now. Why? Because we got beetles and fungus and all these things that are striking them. It's a constant battle and a war. One of the root causes of why it's so damaging there is a lack of biodiversity. There's only a few types of trees that happen to be on that ranch. Now that very same pestilence, just a few hundred miles out, 
out in Sundance, it doesn't have any effect at all because there's far more biodiversity in some of those areas. You see, so it's all a question of, okay, how much resilience do you need for the types of hits the structure is going to take? And that tells you how much decentralization or redundancy you have. Then, what types of things are you doing? Who are the consumers of those things? And that tells you how much optimization you need to do. So how much centralization you have. And the orthogonal question is, why do we trust it? Either because you trust the virtue of the people running it, which is always ephemeral, because even if the dad is great, the son's a fuck up. <laughs> it's true. Look at Cincinnatus, the hero of Rome. His son was so bad that they were actually thinking of executing him for incompetence, but the only reason they didn't do it is no one had the heart to tell the father. <laughs> so you either trust the virtue of the people, which is a good short-term but terrible long-term solution, or you trust somehow the structure of the institution. And for the 21st century, we need new tools to build new institutions, and that's effectively what we're looking at here. So this conversation has brought up a couple of things that I want to get to. And, um, I think I'll start with um, digital identities or decentralized identities. Um, in order to serve consumers better, in order to have more decentralized um, offerings, in order to make sure that we have some kind of transparency, having decentralized identities or DIDs is going to be really important. How do you think that um, we should treat them and they might even be used in the next five years to enable some of the things that we've been talking about, to give the identity, identities, reputation, and trust to the individual? I, I think decentralized identity is uh, entry into the system. Right? You, should, you should enter as a person in the system. Right? So um, they should be in the wallet in, in blockchain, in my opinion, at the very first front of your your your. Uh, your interaction. The problem is after what do you share or what, what do you want to keep uh, secret or private? And this is called selective uh, disclosure. Um, we need we need uh, technologies to actually be able to simply uh, determine what you want to to exchange with uh, someone or with an institution and have control on your uh, uh, data. So it's a key key element. It's the first element uh, of the system. Listen, this would lead to some of the things you were talking about with some of the regulation as well, like especially in banking, right? Having digital identities for people or decentralized identities is a really important thing. And it's also where, to your point about where centralized meets decentralized, how do you know who's participating in transactions and contracts and so on? So how do you think these are going to need to evolve over the next few years in order to be as useful as possible to bring blockchain into the mainstream? Well, gosh, uh, governments control the evidence of identity. What is identity? It's the essence of your being. It's governed by natural law. It has nothing to do with any ID or piece of paper or any other instantiation of who you are. It is who you are. And so uh, that's important because right now there are 15 million people that have, who have come into the United States that do not have those papers that can provide evidence of who they are, and that's the unbanked. And, and there's a tremendous opportunity to create new ways for them to become part of society because they're outside of what the government says is acceptable identities. And one of the unfortunate realities of the Bank Secrecy Act which is what requires the banks to collect all this identity information about you and by the way, share it back and forth. And data in motion is usually less secure than data at rest. And the laws require all this personally identifiable information to be shared around the internet with, between the banks and other financial institutions. And none of us have a say in that. And by the way, most of it is not very secure because it's not encrypted. So it, th there's an enormous uh, amount that can be learned from this. Uh, but we've started to see that, that private businesses have started to do things that are much more reliable than just accepting a government-issued ID. And obviously in your ecosystem as well, there have been attempts at 
uh, at digital identity and also at um, things like the vac vaccine passports, et cetera, that are, that are protected by cryptography and are actually more secure and therefore more reliable than, than what governments produce with a piece of plastic that happens to have your picture on it, which is not that difficult in today's day and age to, to create fakes. Uh, but the flip side of that is, the, and this is inherently one of the challenges with technology, as we get more and more technology that is aimed at convenience and inclusive, inclusivity, especially related to identity, it creates even more ways for, the, for government tyranny to separate and segregate us. And that's one of the challenges with the applications of the tools that we're building. Mm. I have an example, uh, actually. Well, just, just real quickly. Sorry. Um, so I.O. is not building any vaccine passports. <laughs> ah. Just pointing that out. Good. <laughs> And uh, that, you know, identity is an interesting thing because it's such a fundamental concept that humanity has yet to completely figure it out and then explore it and take it. You know, there's a great quote from Shakespeare. It might be apocryphal, but I prefer it my way. <laughs> anyway, he said, all the world's a stage and uh, its people have their exits and entrances and one man in his time plays many roles. And so the reality is that identity is not a singular thing. You have a person, but that person can have many different identities. They have online identities, work identity, family identity, religious identity, the identity when you go see the in-laws who you like, sometimes don't like. You have the identity when you're giving a speech in front of a crowd. You have the identity when you're at the bar getting shit-faced. Okay, so everybody had a different identity. Uh, if they're all merged into one, you're either crazy or you're just so out there you don't care. And we admire those people. D Diogenes was an example of that. So the magic of DIDs is, is that they give us the ability, the centralized identifiers, to make that a little bit more explicit instead of implicit. You can have your game identity. You can have your government-issued identity. You can have the identity that you need for uh, you know, regulation. You can have your throwaway anonymous 4chan identity. But they're all there. And because that's a common shared infrastructure, what you can do is you can construct on top of each and every one of those to your desire and the people who interact with you reputation. That's what matters about identity. When someone says, this is John Smith, you don't really care about the name, you care about who is John Smith? Who is John Galt? Who are these people? What have they done? Where have they gone? Where have they gone to school? Who do they know? How much money do they have? Are they handsome? All the metadata about the identity. Okay, and it's always connected to a context. Do I want to hire them? Do they want them to take care of my kids after school? Um, do I want to tax them? You know, whatever it may be, you have a context associated with that. Again, a lot of these things are somewhat implicit, centralized, opaque, or siloed. And the people who have the power over society, governments, media, whoever it manages to be, are the people who control the reputation and the people who control the silos. So the magic of DIDs are that they allow us for the first time ever to take some of that power back because we no longer need central authorities and institutions to be the connecting tissue to move reputation around. That's the, that's the key thing that we should never lose sight of and we have to be so careful because there's a small window of time for new standards to set. Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Apple, all in their own way are creating identity systems. And they're embedding them into consumer products every single person in this room has, whether it be an Android or iOS. And they'll put clever little names on it like uh, Google ID or Google Authenticator or things like uh, you know Apple Pay or these types of things. Embedded within that is some cursory notion of an identity system. And if whoever wins that, federation or individual, will have a profound impact on your ability to use your life. Your ability to get a loan, your ability to get a job, your ability to pay somebody or not be able to pay somebody, the ability to be paid for doing something. So in addition to being our own bank, controlling our own identity and having it be self-sovereign is the other major challenge in the 21st century. And it's so very foundational and fundamental. It's a challenge this industry has to win to survive.
And that's just it. It, it, it is a challenge because <laughs> we can maybe create the tools to take identity back, but all of us still have to then go to the next step, which is to tell governments and enterprises that we are taking the identity back, and this is ours, this is not yours, and we have to change the balance and dynamic between those institutions that just assume they're entitled to all of that information and say, no, you're not. And, and there may be things that are appropriate for you to have, but there are things that are not appropriate for you to have. And so once those tools are out there, it becomes the role of all of us collectively to make sure that they're utilized in that right way. Yes, there's um, an interesting point uh, that you, you, you are defining. So identity, we should own all identities. We should own all data, right? But uh, those data needs to be uh, useful. My data from my record in France aren't compatible with the US, right? So I don't have a health record in the US, which uh, was really scary for my doctor. So the ability for the data to be interoperable, the system to be interoperable, you need a system to program all of that. So for, for me, blockchain is this system. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think there's business and there's personal. I think this one, I think very personal. And I think everybody does. Your ID what could be more personal. And I think everybody here, I personally am sick and tired of my accounts being compromised. Last time I checked, every single one of my accounts is compromised. And then you got companies making money off of my data. I'm yeah. sick and tired of it. And it makes you feel powerless because, well, it's the way it is, right? That's the, that's the feeling we've come accustomed to. I think it's just a better system, period. And it will, will ultimately be adopted everywhere. I really think we're going to lose that war. I think mm. if we cannot change governments, or if we cannot show meaningful participation with a non-fungible voting system and get people to really you know, show their opinion, it, we're just not going to win that. The only way we can win that is to prove that we can create a trusted identity on a blockchain which holds more trust than what the enterprises and the banks are collecting are able to share among them. And if we're not able to do that, then we're lost before we even started the fight. Hmm. Could follow on under that, I mean, Ramon, you brought up the topic of NFTs. We've seen a lot of new business models, NFTs, DeFi, come up recently um, and be quite successful. What do you think the next set of business models might be for blockchain? What are the, what are the next frontiers for us for changing industries or changing the way we think about a, a particular either vertical or um, market? I know it's a big question. And <laughs> Do you want me to start? Yeah, go yeah. ahead oh, if you'd no. like. I'll, I'll, yeah, so I'll take a crack at it. We, we, we saw the NFT wave start in the last bull market. Right. And then this is the bull market where that became the manifestation of the, of the bull market. And I think what we're seeing in this bull market that will be the manifestation of the next one is all the interoperability across the different systems because each one of them does something differently. And certain ones do certain things better at certain times. And as a result, what's happened is, you know, we're starting to see the idea of wrapped assets that are trading on other chains. Um, and, and I think that's a powerful concept. So um, it's, it's, it's truly cross-chain atomic swaps and interoperability. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the developers <Interesting>. like that. <laughs> What's the next big thing? I, I don't have a crystal ball and I operate in too many countries and it, it's really hard for me to judge. But I would like to get to a place where everybody who had success in building a business today on blockchain and by that has some tokens that they can actually use them or get them into a fiat currency without the scrutiny we see from regulators and banks in the future. So I think the next couple of years is really going to be ensuring that, yeah, well, cross connectivity, not just among the chains, but also among the existing international settlement and clearing chains. And what does AML and KYC and identity among that really means when we're coming with so powerful concepts as blockchain? I know that's a little bit boring and you probably can't trade that, but I think that's that's going to fundamentally change how we in how we interact with blockchains. 
Because what we have today is, if you sit in India, and you are a multinational corporate, and you want to use Cardano, how can you buy ADA and sell ADA if it's unknown if you're even allowed to hold ADA? You don't know what the regulatory context of that is, the bookkeeping principles and all of that. So you take the easy choice. You go with a centralized blockchain because it's kind of still a blockchain, right? It doesn't have all the good things, but from a, you know, you can sell it to the board and you're off with it. And we don't get all the added benefits of this fantastic community. So for me, we really need to go that hard, hard road, which is the interoperability with the existing systems and not just on the chains. The next big thing is governance. Thank you. We are looking at how we come together as human beings, how we organize, organize ourselves, how we engage in commerce together, and all of a sudden we've got this new toolkit that allows us to interact, to consult, to work together, to vote together, and to, idea, to create ideas together in completely new ways using distributed ledger technology, using smart contracts. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about the new ways that we can interact. Wyoming is an example of creating a new type of legal structure. So I think we're going to see how blockchain technology allows us as human beings to interact, to launch businesses, to collaborate, and do it in ways that we can bring in more participation, we can get more voices, we can get different points of views, we can, we can vote together, we can do things together, and we're just beginning to see all of the different ways that we can create new types of relationships and interactions, and this technology is going to make it all available to us. We you know, uh, we, we also need to speak the language of the entity or the network or the system we want to, to integrate or welcome to, to Cardano. For example, Marlowe is a good example. We are speaking the Actus uh, standard, for financial institutions to make it easier for them to understand how they can leverage blockchain. If not, we, we come with a language that no one else understands, right? With uh, 100 uh, new keywords that they have to learn. So we need, we need I, I think for the next five years, we, we should um, focus on, on looking at standards and working on with particular verticals in, in the industry to, to onboard them. I, I personally think that the honest answer is we don't know. And it's one of the exciting things about our industry. I mean, NFTs, I mean, that emerged. That's a new word. That's the ones that get me the most excited, is the ones that we don't know. It's, it's, it disrupts every system in the world. So we could take a guess. I think we're making good guesses here. I think my guess would be the disruption of social media would be the one that I see as the next wave. But the honest answer is we don't know. And that's okay, and that's a good thing. And we need to keep our ear to the ground to make sure that we capture the next wave of innovation. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I had a friend, and every time I'd go over to his house, he never finished anything. You know, you'd see the Super Nintendo, it was on, like the game is still running, but he didn't shut it off. And there's like a half built Lego. Didn't even finish lunch. There's like a half eaten sandwich. <laughs> the chocolate milk is half drunk. And I was like, come on, man, you can do it. At least once in your life, you can finish something. Although he ended up going to college and getting a PhD in physics. So I guess you could finish something. Well, anyway, the blockchain space is a lot like that. Um, we've written a lot of checks as an industry that we can't cash. We keep saying, what's the next thing? Where shall we go? Well, are we done with the whole consensus war, proof of work versus proof of stake? No. Are we done with the whole smart contract thing? No. Are we done with great consumer experiences where grandma can manage private keys properly? No. I mean, just go down the list. Have we actually finished a single damn thing in this industry <laughs> other than really pissing off regulators? I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Really good job. Oh, of man. It's fun. They're talking about it. Uh, so this industry really needs to go back to first principles and say, okay, what do we need to finish in order for this technology to reach a billion people? What needs to get done? And what needs to get done well where we can preserve our principles? Have we as an industry even written them down? Like what is the Bill of Rights of crypto? Don't actually have it. 
we have notions of it, like this idea of an unchanging monetary policy. If you go to Bitcoin land and you say, yeah, you know, that 21 million Bitcoins, it's too much like blackjack. Let's make it 22 million. How about that? Yeah, that's not happening. No one, not even Satoshi, can go in and change that now. It's set in stone. So it seems to be an immutable principle. Okay, I'll buy that. Is that universal? Should all cryptocurrencies then have fixed in stone deflationary monetary policies? Is there room for variation there? This notion of inclusive accountability seems like a phenomenal idea. We love it. You can check your neighbor's homework. Ah, so if you send me a transaction, I know that the tokens exist and they haven't been double spent. I can ver verify it myself with the blockchain. That seems like a really good idea. But in built into that principle is this concept of homogeneity. Everybody has to have the ability to check each other's work. So that's a replicated system. What happens when the blockchain gets to a yottabyte, exabyte, these enormous data scales? What happens when you have a million transactions per second? What happens when the transactions are mostly off-chain and it's a little difficult to see everything that happened? Is it okay to breach that for the sake of scale? Going back to monetary policy, you have these systems that have a bipolar nature to them. On one hand, you have a group of people that say, we really like the store of value, what Bitcoin's brought to the table. You know, over time it appreciates. Yeah, because it's finite and consumption increases. All right, rather inflexible. But when you look at a smart contract system, you say, we want a system where cost is predictable. We want a system where over time cost goes down regardless of the amount of consumption of it. Because we're used to that with consumer products. You see the next big thing come out, it's $5,000. A few years later, it's $200. That's what free market does. It optimizes it. But what we've noticed with smart contract systems is they've become more expensive over time, not less expensive. And that's a feature of the monetary policy. So is that monetary policy then set in stone, if that's your goal? And there's a dozen other things that we can dig into and look into just on the principles alone. And that's what you do before you even write a single damn line of code, hopefully. What are you trying to accomplish? Who are you trying to accomplish it for? These things. So I worry less about the next big thing, and I worry more about these days about finishing the things that we've already started. There's always going to be something sexy and exciting and new. And if I've done my job right, the people on this side of the room are going to take care of that. You guys. Why? Because either you like money or you're passionate about solving a problem. It's just that simple. Or both. <laughs> you know, so many people have a backstory. Something happened to me and now I'm passionate about this. You look at a researcher for pancreatic cancer. The first question you ask is, who died in the family? Almost all of them know somebody who's been lost. If you look at somebody who's deeply passionate about something, usually it's because they've been touched or impacted about it. Or you're just an entrepreneur and you're really ambitious and you want to go build a great business. You guys are going to figure out all those particular problems. But you can't solve those problems unless you're able to cash the checks this industry's written. You need predictable cost. You need great platforms. You need great interfaces. You need app stores. You need billion person scale networks. You need the ability to process the transactions that you laid in these networks with and so forth. These are all the things that are required. And that's what I worry about. Yeah, and I, I to think to build, <laughs> to build all of this, we need you. Um, yeah. that's, that's what would be my only message today. Uh, come to GitHub, push PRs, push issues, and push the Cardano forward. Yeah. Exactly. So Joel, you mentioned governance as something that we really need to pay attention to to make sure that people are heard and treated fairly. What do you think the qualities are of the governance structures that we have to create that will be most effective? Is it confidentiality? Is it transparency? Is it fairness? I think it's probably all of those things. Yeah. Uh, again, the tools that we're using allow us to be able to come together. And so how we come together now becomes the important question. We all have different expertise. We all have different skills. Um, a lot of times those skills and expertise that we have are not always used very well. So 
by bringing together coalitions, and those types of coalitions may constantly change and fluctuate over time given you know, the particular needs, but by bringing coalitions together, we can start to get different voices to the table. We can get different types of experts. We can get different types of opinions and views that ultimately come together to make a better project or a better protocol or a better idea or a better world. And so in return, um, that's where we can use blockchain tools to make sure that we are providing the data, the information, the transparency going back and forth so that we can communicate and do those things better. And so transparency is important. The ability to participate with a certain level of privacy so that you're able to participate without negative consequence is important. The, the uh, ability to act in a socially responsible way using this technology is appropriate. So all of those things together, I think, are, are going to be what we experiment with, with these new types of governance systems and management systems and legal entity systems that are all going to emerge from this. So Charles, just to follow up on what you said, how do you think that we end up cashing the checks that we need to to finish the things that we need to with the community as part of an ecosystem set to really build the infrastructure that everybody's going to need in order to create the next set of applications? Oh, we just got to finish Cardano. That's all we really have to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, but anyway, a little levity aside, uh, you know, first you have to be intellectually honest about what's cashable and what's not, like right. how much is really in the bank account. We have an honesty gap in this industry. There's a lot of ventures that live in the realm of tell you how great, how many TPS or this, that, or next generation this, or word salad this and that. It's noise. It's absolutely noise. Um, and you got to just take a step back and you say, okay, what collections of consumer applications do we feel at the moment something in the industry can run within a, uh, a parameterization of principles. And then what you do is you just kind of work your way outward from there. So are we at the level where we could replicate Microsoft Windows? No. Okay, so that's an outer boundary. Are we at the level that we could replicate the success of Angry Birds as an industry and run at that scale with a great user experience? Maybe, maybe not. You see, so start building that hierarchy. Start walking your way through. What can you build today, right now? And what would you like to build five years, 10 years, 15 years? And then what you need to do is be very clear about what principles and regulations are, are necessary for those things. I'm a simple guy in many respects, and so I really like simplicity. And I, this is why I studied mathematics and other things, why I think the way I do. I'm always trying to take something complicated and make that complicated thing understandable. And if I can't do that, then I don't understand it well enough or the idea is not well enough formed to be understandable. So you look at moral hazards as just a basic example. Kids get unfairness. If Bill gets a sandwich and Alice gets a sandwich and Jane doesn't get a sandwich, something seems wrong. So similarly, should it be the case that when you guys buy something, you know less than another group of people through no fault of your own, but because of a market structure, inside information? Should it be the case that when you trade on an exchange, that your order is deprioritized and someone who's close to the owners of the exchange, their order gets prioritized? You mostly would say, no, that's not fair. That should be illegal. You see, and these are basic things that our industry sometimes seems to get wrong. And if we can't even get that right, how dare we lecture the rest of the world on how we're going to save them? It's just common sense. So those checks have to be cashed properly. We have to go back to first principles and say, what moral hazards do we want to avoid? What guardrails do we want to install? What basic human rights do we want to embed into the operations of the system so it's not don't be evil, but it can't be evil. Don't be corrupt, can't be corrupt. These basic things. And then you look at the application space and say, what application can run this moment right here with this technology with those principles? And it may take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years for us to get there. 
But when we get there, it's a better world. It's a more honest world. It's a world with integrity and transparency. It's a world where we don't get lied to on a regular basis. And that's the world I just want to live in. So it's the long haul. That's why we got the Turtle Island. We're reminding people it is a marathon. It's not a race. Well, marathon is a race. It's not a sprint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we only have a few seconds left. So I just want to thank everybody on the panel for your thoughts. It's been really informative for me. I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Hopefully you all have too. Um, thank, you. thank you. Everybody on the panel. And with that, we are out.